Well, I first met our keynote speaker when our chief invited our local to travel to Edmonton to uh, get some advice on how to develop our medical testing program. And within a the first few minutes of our conversation, the doctor said to us that we were completely on the wrong track. We were thinking like it was 2006, not 2016, and we needed to update our way of thinking. Um, it became quickly clear to us that his uh, practical way of thinking, his forthright and decisive manner, were exactly what we needed to help us with our program, and exactly why we thought he would be the perfect presenter for you today. Dr. Franceschetti is currently an emergency physician at the Royal Alexander Hospital and Northwest Community Health Center in Edmonton. As a professor at the School of Public Health in the, at the University of Alberta, he teaches graduate courses in leadership, ad, advocacy, and public health. Dr. Franceschetti was selected as one of Alberta's top 100 physicians for the century by the Alberta Medical Association College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta, and he was also awarded the Alberta Centennial Medal from the Government of Alberta in 2005. In 2011, he was selected by Alberta Venture as one of Alberta's 50 most influential people. In 2012, he was awarded the Queen's, Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. From 2010 to 2013, he served as the president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And in 2014, he became the president of the Canadian Medical Asso Association. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Louis Franceschetti. Can, can you go back to that previous slide? Because I, I just had one of those moments where I thought I was in the wrong place. January 10th. Is today January 10th? Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was in the right room. Now we'll go back to the other one. I honestly thought for a second there, I said, what the hell's going on here? I'm, I'm about to do the talk and I've got the wrong date on my slides. So what we're gonna do in the next four hours <laughs> it's like, I'm just testing the audience to see if you're awake or not. So I'm not too worried that you didn't come to the front because I'll come to the back. And what we're going to do in the next 40 minutes or so is try and stimulate you to think very, very, very differently. Because if you haven't noticed, the world is changing very rapidly. And recently I gave a presentation that uh, was predicting that in the future, we would have less need for physicians because artificial intelligence would actually take over a big part of what physicians are doing today. So over the next two days, if you're not talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, then you should strike a committee and at least look at the possibility that the future within your career will look very, very different. And so just quickly scanning the literature and quickly scanning what's on social media, you can see what some people are already thinking about the future. I don't know if you've seen some of this futuristic thinking, but uh, you, you respond to a structural fire, and what they do is they open the door and they release 200 little mini drones. And those 200 little mini drones that are very tiny will go through the entire building looking for hotspots, looking for sounds of life, looking for whatever you program them to look for. And within seconds, they'll be able to find a child crying or a source of heat or a source of smoke, identify that, localize it, and then send that information back to a control center. And then that control center decides, is it safe to send a firefighter in? And if it's not, then they're already talking about some sort of thing that they're gonna send in to do a lot of the dangerous stuff that's being done right now. So this is 2018. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is advancing so rapidly that you're starting to see it in your iPhone 10 facial recognition. You're starting to see it in all sorts of daily applications. And it's going to come to a variety of fields. I recently had to have my fingers uh, fingerprinted and they had to go through a criminal check. And when I was talking to the RCMP officer, he said that computers are now doing all the fingerprint matching because they can do it so much better than humans. And so any task that's dangerous, that's repetitive, that requires a high level of intelligence and uh, thought processing is going to, in the very near future, be replaced with artificial intelligence. Now the reason I'm saying that is you have an opportunity when you come to a conference like this to think very differently. 
And if you're not thinking very differently, what ends up happening is you'll get hit by a black swan event. A black swan event is when something comes out of the blue and you say, where the hell did that come from? And you weren't prepared for it and you weren't able to respond to it. Now, there's only one problem with firefighting and the profession today. There's only one problem. And that problem is you've been too successful. You've been too successful in what you've done. And I'll show you the stats. Which means that you're sitting sort of kind of complacent saying, wow, things are good. Yeah, things may be good, but soon people will be questioning everything about the profession and everything about the resources that are allocated to, to the profession. And they're going to be saying, are we getting value for dollar? We're doing that in medicine today. We're doing it in just about every aspect of, med of, of you know, society. But I think firefighting is one that um, the day of reckoning is coming very quick. And so you should be in control of that day, and you should change the discussion, and you should change the agenda, and you should show them that you're way ahead of the curve on this one, all right? So a keynote speaker, a good keynote speaker, comes in and kind of shakes things up, right? Respectfully, will challenge the way you think, will engage you, and leave you at the end going, wow, I never thought about that, which is what they want me to do, or wow, we've got a great opportunity before us right now, or that makes sense, that's what I was thinking, but I just didn't know how to express it. So the slides that I'm gonna show you are pretty well all over the map, but they're meant to be a tool for you, because I'm gonna give them to you. After I leave, I'll leave them with the conference organizers, and you're free to use these slides in whatever way works for you. All right, you're free to use these ideas and add on them as well. Does that work for you if we try and do that? We've got a very limited time frame to try and get this across, but I've developed a technique that can actually brainwash you into thinking twice as fast. So I'm gonna brainwash you. You'll be able to think twice as fast. I'll talk even faster, and then by the end of it all, hopefully we'll have a collective sigh and a, a good round of discussion because I think the best part of any presentation is the end of it. So I'll try to get to it as quick as I can, all right? So this is gonna be fast paced. It's gonna be all over the place, but it's designed to be like that. So once the dust settles, um, all the introductory comments that Gord made about mental health, about family, about wellness, about pride, about our brotherhood, our sisterhood, uh, the fact that we're so committed to what we do, that should all come together so that when you have the rest of the two days, hopefully you'll be able to say, yeah, but that guy said this, or well, I think this, or I challenge that thinking. How crazy that they're gonna open the door and send, you know, if it's a really big building, 3,000 drones into the building to find out where the fire is. Like, where did that stupid idea come from? There's, a, there's people out there that are thinking this stuff right now. And what I'm trying to tell you once again is the technology is evolving so rapidly that you have to pay attention to it. Current computing power works like this. If you go to the Vancouver Library and you wanna find a book that I've put an X in, okay? I'm gonna to go to the Vancouver Library later and I'm gonna take a book off the shelf, I'm gonna open the cover and I'm gonna put an X in it. And then I'm gonna misfile it, all right? Somewhere in the library. Our current computing power works like this. To find that book, it would have to go into the library and it would have to look at each book individually. Even if there's hundreds of thousands of books, and no matter how fast a computer is, it would have to look at each book individually. Quantum computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, being developed in Vancouver as we speak right now, and that's being beta tested, would work like this. If I wanna find that book, all the books would be looked at once. All the books would be looked at at the same time to find that X. That's how fast computing power is coming down the pipeline. So think about the fact that if your union says, we wanna be at the forefront of this, we wanna collect every fire call that's ever been done in North America and Europe and anywhere in the world and put it into a data bank so that when we respond to a particular fire, that data bank would instantly bring up every similar fire that's ever occurred in the world and the consequences of that fire. Now that's what I call a command center. So that if you've got men and women that are about to go into a dangerous situation and you can ask all the experience in the world that's ever been gathered around firefighting at your fingertips 
don't you think you can make better decisions than, mm, I don't know, maybe we'll go in this door, no, we'll go in that door. In the heat of the moment, you're not thinking very well. So this is the kind of stuff that you got to start thinking. All right? That's what I want to challenge you. So this is what we're going to do. We're, we're pretty well at the stage where we've got it pretty well made, right? Here we are at the Empress, one of the nicest hotels in the world. We're very comfortable. We've got a nice social program. This is it. It doesn't get much better than this, right? You've got to acknowledge that. We're here now. It doesn't get much better. But every now and then, it's good to do a reality check, and that's what I'm going to do in about four slides. I'm going to give you a reality check that's going to make you sort of say, hmm, maybe this guy's onto something. And then after that, what we're going to do is try and come up with solutions to this problem. And I don't necessarily see it as a problem as I see it as an opportunity. And then it's to get you involved so that you feel it's your move. Because remember, at the end of the day, I'm leaving, right? I'm leaving. I'm going back to Alberta this afternoon, and I'm going to go back to doing what I do, which is an emergency physician, and I'm just going to go right back to taking care of all the people that keep coming into our emergency department. So I work at the Royal Alex, busiest emergency department in Western Canada. And the other day, we had no less than, as I was counting, 14 crews waiting with stretchers for patients to come in with a waiting, waiting room of about 45 patients. And inside our department, we had about 35 that were admitted that weren't going upstairs. It was just total chaos. And that's day in, day out in our environments, all right? So when you come to our environments, that's the world we live in. And so we're trying to rethink how we do what we do. So uh, I can guarantee you that this will not be your sort of typical boring presentation. I'm going to get you engaged. I want to find out what's on your mind. And then afterwards, collectively, I want to try and start coming up with solutions. Does that work? All right. And at any time, if you want to say anything, at any time, if you want to sort of say, I don't know if I agree with you, Doc, just put up your hand. All right. Put up your hand. Tell me where you're from, who you are and then we'll have a conversation. You don't have to wait till the very end because you may forget the conversation. So why don't we take a look at the big picture? I'm a numbers kind of guy, so I, I have the fortune of having a connection with uh, Surrey Fire Services. I know the chief very well. He's uh, kind of a thinker that I like, and over the years, we've exchanged ideas, and uh, recently we met with, the, as was mentioned earlier, with uh, union management and firefighters to come up with I don't know if it's a better way, but a way to make absolutely sure that firefighters get every chance to be as healthy as possible and to drop dead healthy. That's the goal. We want firefighters to drop dead perfectly healthy at the end of their career. Wouldn't that be great? 85, making love to your wife, drop dead. <laughs> better than your girlfriend, right? <laughs> so the whole point is, we got to figure out how to do that. And if we're going to do that, I said to, I said to um, Larry, their deputy chief, I said, you know, wh what are you guys actually responding to? And he said, okay. He said, well, uh, give me a day or two and I'll come back. And so I said to myself, well, you know, if it's a fire service, you know, they're, they're doing fire stuff, right? I mean, that's, that's what fire services are all about. So when I saw that 65% of calls were, had nothing to do with fire, totally nothing to do with fire, and then I started adding up the numbers and I said, wait, motor vehicle collisions, uh, the second one is 12%. Injury related is another seven. That's another 20. 20 plus 65 is 85. So 85% 85 of calls, at least in Surrey, this might change in your department, have got nothing to do with fire. And then you start looking at the list as to actually how many fires you're dealing with and you go, wait a second, what have they done? How come they're so successful? It's called the fire department but they don't go to fires. That's a success story, right? You don't have to try and hide that. That's a success story. So through building codes, through laws and legislation, and through the preventative work that you've done, you've been very successful. So maybe the time is here to reinvent yourself, right? Maybe the time is here to reinvent yourself. So having said just that, having said just that, what I'd like to find out is what's on your mind. So take out your electronic devices, take out an iPad, iPhone, anything with an internet connection. And if you do this, I appreciate it, because the more numbers, uh, the better the response rate. And if you go to DR, if you go back to the other one, so they get the address, 
if you go to, now don't Google this, actually go to the web browser and type in drlou.ca forward slash survey. So remember, don't Google this. Just type in drlou.ca forward slash survey. And what, what it should look like is the next computer. We'll show you what the screen looks like. And it says, hello, what's on your mind? So January 8th, 2018, Victoria. Don't click on that. That's just so I know where these comments are coming from. So this is what I want you to do. So, yeah, it's, uh, I'll give it to you again. It's D-R-L-O-U dot C-A forward slash survey. And uh, we'll let some people start entering stuff so you can see what happens. So I just showed you a slide that says you, you don't go to too many fires. I just told you, you got to think very differently. So just tell me what's on your mind with those simple comments. So I'm looking for comments like, so what? I like it the way it is. We got to change. Uh, we need this. We need to do. And you'll see, as you start entering, and if you go to the second one, okay, my wife just texts, we need to evolve, change. Okay, you get, the, you get the gist of what's going on. And if you see a comment that someone made that you agree with, just click on it and enter that, and then that way the numbers will start showing up and we can start counting. So like January 8th, Victoria, don't click that. There's nine clicks. Uh, that was a waste of a click. <laughs> but you, you can go back and do it again, all right? You can go back and do it again. So this, this is important for us. So need to evolve our medical game, need to take over EMS, Service delivery adjustment, uh, need more mental health training. Uh, how do we evolve? Fire medic, how do we evolve? I don't think people ever will be replaced. I wish we had more fires. <laughs> maybe at your house. Why don't we go light your house on fire with your kids in there and maybe your family? Would you like more fires? Watch what you say, because sometimes it'll come back to haunt you. Okay, because nobody will do the other stuff. Change is necessary, creating an inclusive workplace. Okay, do we advertise ourselves correctly? Fire offer way more services than fire. Fire prevention department, fire EMS, fire medic. Fires are burning hotter and faster. Fires are less common, highest risk, fishing. Okay, so you get the gist, right? So what we're gonna do is you keep adding these and then we're gonna come back to this in probably about 10, 15 minutes and, and recheck where you're thinking. All right, so this is really important because this gives me an idea of how open you are to change or how fixed you are with the current paradigm, all right? Now, if, if statistics are correct, 80% of you are probably quite happy with the way things are. 10% of you will resist change at all cost, but 10% of you are open to the idea of trying to do things differently. So I'm trying to get those 10% to get the other 80% that quite isn't ready to move in our direction. The 10% that are hardcore and are gonna fight this to death, you can't do anything about it, so just be aware that they're there and try and work with them and have them as close to you as you possibly can. I always try and have people that oppose my ideas as close to me as opposed to far from me, so make sure they're included in the process as well, all right? Okay, so let's go to the very top and then, uh, no, let's go to the top of that list and scroll down so that we can see, because they're all alphabetical. All right, so go to the very top. At the top. Yeah, okay. So arti artificial intelligence versus jobs, cancer, heart, head, uh, three killers of firefighters, because nobody else will do this stuff. Change, change is necessary, so change perception of what we do, so change is quite a big one. Change shouldn't be feared, combined service, continue to evolve, creating an inclusive, go up, diversity is important. Do we advertise ourselves correctly? Fire is the Swiss army knife of society. Fire offer way more service than fire. Fire prevention, fire EMS, fire medic. Fires are burning hotter and fast. Fire is less common. Fires will never completely go away. Fishing, forward thinking, future, get ahead of the game. How do we evolve? How do we evolve the thinking of the service? How to change? I don't think people will ever. I love lamp. I love lamp. Okay, I, I really like how this session has started. I wish we had more fires. I would like to expand my, I would like to expand my, I would like to expand my, I'm in a room of males and somebody wants to expand my penis? What, what do you want to expand? Okay, more education if fire, okay, more staffing, more technical. My wife just texted, 
Need for more mon mental health, needs more staffing, need to be ahead of the game. Need to Need more arsonists. Yeah, that's the guy about to fire. He got embarrassed, so now he's blaming someone else, you know. <laughs> Our city needs to see serious numbers. Paramedics working with firefighters, preventing job is there. okay. Pre reality check time. Okay, good. PTSD. And it keeps going. Service delivery adjustment, still not good success at other. There are still two fires a day utilizing GIS and how clear it Holy macro, you guys are far more engaged than I thought. What's We're, for lunch? What's for lunch? <laughs> What's in it for me, I guess? Where do we start? Why is it so hot in here? Okay, well, that's a great way to start. Maybe that's the one thing we can control. Okay, so let's get started then. This is helpful. This is really helpful as, as we move forward because I, I, I get a, a gist of what's on your mind, and I see an opening, right? So I see an opening that I want to try and change. Now, to do that, I've got to brainwash you, all right? Now, this is Trust me, I'm a doctor. You're all trained in at least if someone has a cardiac arrest, we can at least call 911 and start the process. I've never had any side effects of this, but uh, possibly there could be. This is what I want you to do. You see the colors red, green, blue, yellow, black? You see them? All right, what I want you to do is start saying them from the top to the bottom. Now you're a little shy. You're gonna say them softly and you're gonna say them slowly. I'll encourage you over three cycles to say them fast, say them loud. I'm gonna switch the slide. And I'm going to give you colors, and I want you to say the colors quickly. Without thinking, give me the colors. Then I'll show you a third slide. And if you see green on the third slide, you're under my spell. But it only lasts about 40, 40 minutes or so. Are you ready? You trust me? Trust me, I'm a doctor. OK, here we go. Red. Green. Faster and louder. One more time. Colors. Colors. All right. Okay, I got you, right? That's called this, the, uh, there's a, uh, a name for that test. There's a name for that test. So, you know, the next thing you got to do is find out who's in the room because different generations think very differently. And you can't have one message that's going to meet the needs of all the audience. So figure out where you're at. How many of you are sort of the silent generation? You should be retired. You shouldn't be here. How many of you are, 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 are baby boomers? There's, I mean, how many baby boomers here? A lot of us baby boomers. What about Generation X? We got some Xs. How many Ys? There should be a lot of Ys as fire. Yeah. And how many, Generation Z or Generation At? There's probably not too many born after 95 in here, is there? But, uh, you know, when I was coming here, my grad students, I, I start teaching today, that's why I've got to get back. My grad students said, what are you doing on, uh, on Monday that you're not here? And I said, well, I've got to go give a talk to firefighters. And, uh, oh, they said firefighters. They said, I don't know. They're going to they're gonna ride you, especially they're from B.C. You know, they don't like Albertans. You know, they're, gonna, they don't, they're not letting our pipeline through. You know, you're going to get really <laughs> razzed. And I said, nah. I said, what the hell could they ask me that I don't know? So they started testing me, and they asked me a question, and uh, wouldn't you know it, they got me. They asked me, why is Generation Y called Generation Y? And I just thought it was like X, Y, and Z, and they said, no, Doc. Why is Generation Y called Generation Y? Do you know? Yeah, I have a lot of questions. Why me? Okay, Generation Y, can you stand up? All the Gen Ys in the room, stand up. If you're a Gen Y, stand up. Now get ready for this, because I never, never thought that this is why Gen Y was called Gen Y. <laughs> you know, you gotta go figure. You gotta go figure. Where the hell did they come up with that one, you know? And then I found out the majority of them become pipe fitters, which makes sense, right? Because that's, that's your typical pipe fitter. All right, so if we're going to step back now and say, okay, we got to do things differently, let's really step back. Let's step back and look at the planet Earth, right? We're talking about 7.1125 billion people. And if you take a look at the distribution of those people, the majority are a Asians and from the Middle East, then Africa, then Europe, then Latin America, and then uh, South Pacific represents one little sliver, and Canadians and Americans represent this little bar right here. We represent a very small fraction of the world's population. Yet if you take a look at the population of the world and shrink it down to a village of 100, so there's about 200 of you, so if you were to take 
half of you, and you represent the world, this is what the representation would be like. So the majority of people that are in the world today are living in, you know, not as nice conditions as we are. And that's why, especially for us in North America, we've got to figure out ways of doing things better so that we can free up resources so that we can share these resources with people that really need them, all right? That's the real big picture as we're moving forward. 2017 should be the start, 2018 should be the start of when we start saying, wait a minute, we got to do things differently so that we can free up resources so that other people can have the same fortunes that we have sitting here, all right? So let's take a walk together and, and, and look at what the ideal situation is <laughs> that probably brought you to this stage. Now, this is a sad day for me because my dad passed away yesterday. 89 years old, he was in palliative care, you know, he lived a, a really good life, but he still did pass away and you only have one dad. And so I, I'm sort of in that sort of funny kind of phase going, well, this, this thing called life is gonna end pretty soon. And so I ran some quick numbers and I've probably got about 20 years left. And in those 20 years, I wanna make a difference, right? And so I wanna look for people that think similarly, that can amplify the message and can make the change that's gonna really make a difference in the lives of a lot of people. And so well, I had dinner last night with Len and uh, we sort of said to each other, you know, how can we make things so different that it'll amplify the, the little voice that we have right now and create a change that's gonna be really meaningful? And like uh, Gord said at the very beginning, I mean, you guys are well organized, very well organized and you got a strong sense of history and a strong sense of culture and a strong sense of wanting to do something that's right. If we can tap into that and realign it respectfully so that the ideas come from you and you know, with a little bit of guidance, we, we can start doing things that are gonna be so revolutionary that it actually frees up resources so that you can do more of that kind of stuff and then free up resources that we can use in you know, communities here first that need our help, but then internationally as well. So that, that picture, I don't know, I don't know how my mom said, that's the earliest picture she had of me, but I don't know where they got that picture, but it's, it's quite interesting. But here, here's what's really important. You know, someone took really good care of you on your first day. Someone made absolutely sure that you had the best possible education that you could have. Someone made absolutely sure that you had the opportunity to establish a career like you've picked right here. And for some of you, you may have fallen in love, and for some of you, you may have started a family. But, you know, the reality is, we've got to try and get everyone so that they're similar to you and not here. And what I mean by that is, you're here because somebody took really good care of you, all right? And if they didn't, and you overcame that, then we've got to figure out what you did, because you are some of the top performing people in the world. And what we have to do is harness that to make you even better at what you do and the potential of who you can become, all right? That's the bottom line of what we're trying to do here today. Now, this is the one thing I've not seen, heard, or um, what's the word? It, it's not out in the open, yet, you know, the one thing that we know makes people healthy is love. The ability to love someone and the ability to be loved. And yet, uh, at any of your union meetings, do you guys talk about love? Do you guys talk about happiness? Do you guys, no, but you know you, what? Yeah, maybe in your hotel room, but you know, the, 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 the whole point is, the whole point is you gotta start getting down to the basics. And why do we not talk about this? One of the most important things known to man in terms of your health is love, right? So it, this is like, it's saying, well, this is, we're firefighters. What do you wanna talk to us about love? Well, you know, if you don't have this thing called love in your life, um, you're not gonna have a full life and you're not gonna be healthy. Simple stuff, all right? I'm gonna introduce you to simple stuff that I was taught over the years. Over the years, I've done many things. I started off in, you know, as a photographer, I worked for Syncrude. I do a lot of industrial training. I've done work with EMS, developing electronic records. I was president of Canadian Medical Association. I was president of the Royal College. I've had a lot of opportunities to be shaped by some great leaders and, um, you know, the thing that I like doing the most out of everything I do, I was doing yesterday, which is finishing my ice rink. I've been looking for a used Zamboni 
for 10 years and I finally found one in Ontario and I had it shipped out. And my wife thinks I'm crazy because all I do all day long is finish the ice on the rink <laughs> so that the kids can skate. But that's, that's sort of to let you know a little bit of what makes me tick. You know, I do a lot of really exciting things, but the things that I'm finding are really exciting are talking to folks like you and trying to see if the potential is there to do things that are even greater. Now, you respond to a lot of injury calls. Let me tell you one thing. Injury is a disease. Cancer is a disease. AIDS is a disease. Injury is a disease. All right? Injuries are not accidents. Every time you respond to an injury event, you're responding to a disease. And the sooner you start thinking of injury as a disease, the sooner you're going to start getting it under control. And in your age group, injury is the leading cause of death. So the most likely reason one of you today under 45 is going to die is from injury. If you're under 34, it's motor vehicle injuries. And if you've got kids at home between the ages of 0 and 19, injury is the leading cause of death, exceeding all other causes of death combined. All right? So when you respond to about 20% of your calls to injury, that's a disease that's totally preventable. Nobody owns it. Own it. Own it. Claim it. Say enough is enough. 20% of our calls are injury related. We are the ones that are going to take responsibility for reducing injuries within our society. And if you can do that, you're going to save an enormous amount of resources, right? You're going to save an enormous amount of resources. And it's going to free up a lot of time. If, you know, less than 20% of your time you're on these calls, that means you've got 20% more time to do other stuff. Even if you do 20% of your time dreaming about what the future could be like, I'd love that. I would have no problem with firefighters sitting around dreaming, thinking of how to make absolutely sure no truck ever rolls out of your fire hall. It'd be kind of boring, wouldn't it? But other societies are aiming for that. Sweden, for example, has realized that firefighters, there's just no fires to go to anymore. And so they're called rescue services, and their firefighters actually get masters of public health degrees because they need to be retrained to meet the needs of society. We've got to meet your needs, but more importantly, we've got to meet society's needs. And if society's needs are that you have to reinvent yourself into something different, then reinvent yourself. Lead that, as opposed to it coming down the pipeline. Budgets are very tight everywhere. People are looking at, are we getting value for our dollar, as we mentioned earlier? And trust me, they're looking at your budgets. They're looking at my budgets. And so as leaders, we have to figure out a way to make absolutely sure we're delivering on the needs of society, not our needs, on society's needs, okay? So injury is a big problem. Fatigue is a major problem. A lot, of the, a lot of the calls that you go out to are actually fatigue related. We're a very fatigued society. You can measure fatigue. If you want to know if a firefighter is fatigued, you can put a device on their head that the Germans make and it tracks their eye movement and it'll give you a fatigue printout of how fatigued that firefighter is. I think every firefighter that shows up for work should get fatigue tested. And if they're fatigued, you know what you do? You don't send them home. You just tell them to go have a half hour nap. That's all they need. It'll improve their performance 37%. All right? And they're less likely to be injured if they're not fatigued as well. So think of fatigue management very differently. And I can tell you right now, if you do not have a fatigue management protocol in place and something happens with one of your firefighters driving down the road and falling asleep and plowing into my car, heaven forbid it should be my car, because I'm going to sue your ass off. If a firefighter falls asleep at the wheel of a vehicle and, and is involved in a collision, you can rest assured that's going to court and that's going to cost somebody a lot of money. All right? You have to have a fatigue management program in place. If you don't, that's what the courts are looking for. All right? Simple stuff that you don't even think about. Suicide. Suicide is a major problem within our society. Major problem in a variety of different ways. So people that want to commit suicide usually try if they're on the road running into the biggest thing coming down the street. If there's a pumper coming down the street very fast and somebody wants to kill themselves, man, that pumper looks very appealing to drive right into. And when I give this talk to the trucking industry, the trucking industry tells me that this is a problem within trucking, where people are committing suicide by running into 
big trucks coming down the roadways. All right? How many of you know someone that's attempted or committed suicide? Put up your hand. I mean, look at you. It's like 80, 75. Let's even be generous and say it's only 70% of you put up your hand. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Suicide is an injury. Suicide is a disease. All right? So these are things that we have to feel comfortable talking about. So we're living in a society right now where solitude, loneliness are creeping up. And we have to come right out and acknowledge we've got a major problem with substance misuse, substance abuse, and the problem is only going to get worse come next July. Once marijuana is legalized, you have not seen anything compared to what's going to happen in Colorado and Washington and other places. Injury rates are going to increase by 33%. Drug driving fatality rates are going to double right off the bat. We're going to see a dumbing down of the nation. Psychosis in our young people is going to increase. Addiction rates are going to increase quite substantially. And the list just goes on of the consequences of this legislation. Now, I'm, I'm, from B I'm not from BC, but I, I have a BC connection. Later, when you have time, just Google Francis Cuddy and asshole, and you'll see there's a whole website devoted to what an asshole I am from some guy in BC who likes smoking his marijuana and thinks I should shut my goddamn fucking mouth up because I don't have a fucking clue what I'm talking about when it comes to marijuana, and I regularly get love mail, shut up asshole, was the last one I got last week, from people that like to smoke their shit, you know, but don't like to be told that you can't, you know, talk about it, so... Google it, it's fun. My, my son accidentally found it. His name is Lewis as well. And his buddies were going, ah, you're such an asshole. And they, what do you, what do you say then? He goes, well, Google Lewis Francis Cuddy an asshole. And there it is, the website. With a little kid giving me the finger. It's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's classic Trump. I mean, I don't know where else this, uh, this comes from. All right, so family violence. This is a big problem, not only for women, but for men as well, all right? I stopped asking women in our emergency department, are they in abusive situations, because I did not have the resources to deal with the number of women that are being abused. Totally unacceptable, right? Totally unacceptable. So, brings us to everyone's favorite topic, right? Mental illness. Nobody likes to talk about mental illness, yet the facts pretty well speak for themselves. Huge problem, big problem within your profession as well. Just evidenced by the displays out there, right? There's nothing wrong with talking about this, and yet we're still very uncomfortable talking about this. Answer this question only if you're comfortable answering it. How many of you have ever had fever? Put up your hand. If you've had a fever, put up your hand. How many of you have ever had stitches? Cut yourself. How many of you have ever broken a bone? All right, holy mackerel. How many of you have ever had that really shitty, watery diarrhea? Smelly as hell. <laughs> put up your hand. You never had that? How many of you had mental illness put up your hand? Very few of you. Some of you have got the courage to do it, but a lot of you will, would rather hold that hand down and say, I, I just can't put my hand up. I just can't put my hand up, right? Because you're just not comfortable. And yet, I know you're a bunch of liars because if you're considered normal people, 35% of you should have put your hands up. Out of a room of 250 or so, that means about 70 of you should have put up your hands. Maybe about 12 of you did. Courageously, courageously. If I said, how many of you have asthma, you're gonna frick up, throw up your hand, show me your turbo inhaler, rocket powered, nitrous oxide, and how many of you got diabetes, you're gonna show me those new pens, any other disease, you'll put up your hand and you'll be so proud of it, but mental illness or brain health issues, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going there, I'm not going there. And that's why this is such a big problem, and especially in men who can't talk about it, they try and self-medicate, and they'll, they'll drink, right? And if the drinking doesn't work, they'll do drugs as well. And then that can only make them feel better for a certain amount of time. And unfortunately, what they end up doing, a lot of them, is killing themselves. And, and men, when they try and kill themselves, are usually completing the attempt, as opposed to females. Females will try overdoses, which is bad enough, but men will try and hang themselves, shoot themselves, jump off heights, or do things that there's there's no turning back from, right? And so these are the kinds of things that are difficult to talk about, but we gotta talk about them, right? Because we know they're out there. And they're out there in your kids. Our kids have never been so frickin' stressed. Our kids today have never been so stressed. 
And I think it's all the electronic gadgetry they have that's really screwing up their minds. Uh, if, if you want to screw up the mind of a child before the age of two, put them in front of a television or give them an iPad or an iPhone or an Android. Kids under the age of two should not be exposed to any kind of electronic device. It rewires the circuitry in their brain. All right? Okay, so we, we talked about brain health. You know, put this on the parking lot list. This is something that has to be on your agenda for sure. So if we got a problem here, we got a big problem. And the problem is this, is that in the first 18 months of life when the brain is developing so rapidly, as a society we don't spend enough time and attention raising the next generation so that they don't have opioid problems, so that they don't have mental illness, so that they don't have cancer, and the rest of it. A society that neglects the first 18 months of a child's life is a society that's going to have to pay the consequences later on in life. There's a simple thing you could do. Firefighters promoting the first 18 months of life. If, if, if you men and women can get behind and getting people to understand the importance of early childhood development, you're going to be doing society a big favor. And you're, but you're going to say, but, but that's not fighting fires. No, it's got nothing to do with fighting fires. It's got to do with improving society. And you're saying, well, that's not my responsibility. It's got to be somebody's responsibility. You're not going to fires. You're going to other stuff. Are you doing that stuff well? Remember, these are all rhetorical questions. I don't have the answers. I don't have the answers to them. Maybe you are. Maybe nothing's going to change. Maybe everything's perfect just the way it is. Maybe 15 years from now you're going to say, shit, remember that guy that drove the Zamboni? He warned us about this. And if I'm still around, drop me an email. Drop me an email. So the whole point is, the things that make you healthy have got nothing to do with the healthcare system. The things that make you healthy are called the social determinants of health. And I can tell you who's healthy or not just by knowing your postal code. I can tell who's healthy or not just by looking at your T4s from last year. I can tell you who's healthy or not by testing your literacy level. I can tell you who's healthy or not by just looking at your income and your resilience and your emotional intelligence. Right? Those are key words. Those are things that make people unhealthy. And people that are unhealthy are going to call 911. That's the majority of your medical calls. Heart attacks, totally can be prevented. Diabetes, totally can be prevented. Right? Respiratory, most of them could be prevented. There's certain things that can't, but the majority of the things that we respond to and deal with are preventable. So how do we make absolutely sure everyone has the opportunity to be where you're at? In society, you know, you need your basic food, water, sleep, shelter, and then you need security, feeling that you belong to something, and then you need a sense of belonging. You've got that, you know, you, you belong to a, a brother and sisterhood, and then you're feeling good and you're here to try and get better, right? So you guys and gals are performing at this level. When I see someone in emergency, the nurses know my tricks. Somebody has called fire, who then calls ambulance, who then calls police, Right? Three responders respond to a person brought to the Royal Alex and makes a chart for $3,000, sees me, and then I check on our computer. That's his fourth visit in two days. Fourth visit in two days, activating EMS, police, and fire every time. And you know what that person basically just needs? I give him a soup, I give him a sandwich, I give him a shower and a fresh set of socks, and then I ask him why they're there, and they don't know. They go, thanks, Doc, I feel much better already. So why are we transporting people that don't need anything to an acute care facility? Don't we have a better model out there? Don't we have a better model to deal with individuals that just are looking for the basics in life that you and I have and we take for granted? Right? Very expensive to do what we do in return for what we get at the end of the day. You know, for millions of years we were hunters gatherers we were constantly foraging and I forgot to acknowledge you know uh, respectfully that we're on treaty land and for many years you know these these men and women and in other parts of the world were hunter gatherers and we've and they were pretty healthy they di they lived a short life because they died of uh, primarily traumatic injuries okay and infectious diseases that there was no cure for but when they lived they were very healthy lean mean sort of basically fighting machines. And in the last 27 years, we've gone from that to this, right? And this is not very healthy. 
And the consequences of that are that people want to get to feel good. And if you're not healthy, you don't feel good. If you don't feel good, then you go to these things because these things instantly make you feel good. Salt, fat, sugar, there's a whole industry revolving around them, the fast food industry. And they figured out ways to make you feel good. That first bite of the burger feels good. The first slug of the beer or wine or whatever feels good. The salt feels good. The drugs feel good. You know, the fatty stuff feels good. All that stuff feels good, but it's got consequences. And the consequences are that all those things we do to ourselves, right, will have an impact. And the impact can be simply uh, stated this way. Three risk factors, the biggest one, smoking inactivity and poor nutrition contribute to four different kinds of diseases. Certain cancers, diabetes, chronic, respiratory, and cardiovascular, and that's 50% of the disease burden. So 50% of the reason why people are not healthy today is related to smoking, inactivity, and poor nutrition. Smoking, that's sort of up your alley, right? I think. Poor nutrition could become. Fitness, I mean, most of you look pretty fit to me. So why not become the folks that create a fitter society? Remember, uh, uh, I think his name was Andrew Terrence, a uh, hockey player in Edmonton, would go out for a run in the River Valley every morning, and he would, in, he would ask people to join him for a run. And he had people running that never ran before just because of the prestige of running with Andrew Terrence. Maybe, I don't know, crazy idea. What if firefighters were to go and do exercise out in the community and invite the community to go with them, whether they're in wheelchairs, whether they're seniors, whether they're kids. It's the firefighter fitness program. Now you're going, what the hell? Where did they get this guy? Asshole. <laughs> you know, I don't want to get too far ahead of you here, but you, you see what I'm trying to do to you here? I'm trying to tell you, you got to do things differently. And if we know that 50% of Canadians are sick, because of three things they're doing. Uh, you can become experts in how to get people to quit smoking. You can become experts in how to get people moving. And you can become experts in what people should eat. Not that hard. With a little extra training, you guys can become the experts. And gals can become the experts in that, right? So when we have 5% of the population consuming 65% of healthcare costs in any one given year, I mean, we're starting to identify the folks that need our help, right? 5% of people in BC will consume 65% of your healthcare budget, right? Okay, these are targeted audiences that we can go after. In the US and Canada, $2.8 trillion are spent on healthcare, of which 35% is totally wasted. Totally, totally wasted. It's the equivalent of about $700 billion a year. That's a lot of money, okay? And then the leading causes of death, you're worried about the leading causes of death in firefighters. They pretty well parallel society with maybe a little increase in cancers. The numbers that I've seen are possibly 8%. There's some questionable studies that say it's no different, but let's assume that it's, let's say it's 8% higher. So then let's try and focus on minimizing your overall cancer risk. And if we can figure out how to do it for you, why can't we do it for society as well, right? What's good for firefighters is good for society. And that's the motto of what we're trying to do in Surrey, is to create the most, the most healthy, well-protected, well-screened fire force, and then transferring that to the people that live in Surrey. If it's good enough for Surrey firefighters, it should be good enough for people that live in Surrey. And I'm gonna benefit from this project because I gotta lose weight. And there's no way I'm gonna go tell a firefighter to lose weight if I'm carrying extra weight. So Jeff and I that are working on this project said, well, let's eat those big breakfasts because they're about to disappear, right? You, you can't be saying one thing. And the one thing that's important for you to remember is the third leading cause of death in the United States is medical error. This is what happens to patients when they're in healthcare facilities. The third leading cause of death. So there's another reason to keep people healthy because healthcare systems kill people. Oh, shh, did I say that out loud? Please don't tweet that out. Because we've got you believing that healthcare systems are safe. They're not, all right? They're not. So how many Canadians die a year from injuries, this disease? 15,000. It's the equivalent of a fully loaded 737 crashing every four and a half days. I'm having so much time, I lost track of time. What time is it? Are we okay? Okay, let me know when. 
Okay, good. <laughs> Society has accepted injuries, right? Society has accepted injuries. Society thinks that it's okay that we have these events day in, day out. Shit happens, time's up, tickets, you know, wrong place, wrong time. You've heard them all, freak accident. You've heard all the excuses. Other countries that have taken this problem seriously, Sweden, for example, used to have an injury rate this high. Sweden's gone down to here. Okay, it's a problem that's solvable if you want to solve the problem. It's an expensive problem. From the moment 911 is activated to the time the patient's either dead or discharged, it's an incredibly expensive disease, probably one of the most disruptive and expensive diseases that we treat. So if we're going to talk about injury, then you have to have a definition of it. Anytime excess energy is applied to the body, you're going to cause an injury event. Or the absence of essentials, like oxygen or heat. That's injury. That's the definition of injury. Injury is a complex problem. It's, it's not good enough to say, oh, just wear your seatbelt and be safe. You've got to peel back the layers of the onion, and you've got to say, well, what have other people done to be able to reduce injuries, and how can we do it, and how can we lead the charge? We want to do for injuries what we did for fire. That's what I'd like to hear coming out of firefighters' mouths. We want to do for injuries what we did for fire. We were so successful in getting this fire beast under control, we're now going to claim injury as the next target that we're going to go after. Claim it. No one else has claimed it. Own it. We know what it is. It's either intentional or unintentional. The intentional is what we do to each other and then what we do to ourselves. And the unintentional is the motor vehicles and the falls, poisonings, burns, drowning. These are all familiar terms because you go to these, right? You go to these. But start viewing it as a disease. And, and we, can, we can help you, we can teach you how to prevent this disease, how to treat this disease, right? This is stuff that does not have to happen in 2018. And we know that for Canadians under 44, I mentioned it earlier, injury is the leading cause of death. So figure out what your age is. If you're under 44, injury is the most likely thing to kill you. If you're under 34, it's a car crash. The only good news about car crashes is cars aren't going to be driving themselves for much longer. Cars will not be driving themselves for much longer. And I suspect, I suspect that any EMS vehicle, any police vehicle, and any fire vehicle in the future will not be driving, uh, it will, will not have a driver. It'll be driven uh, autonomously, right? Think about that. It's coming because it, it can probably get to the scene a lot safer than if we drive them. A, a scary feeling, isn't it? Would you love to be in a fire truck barreling down the road and this computer is driving it? Get used to the idea. Get used to the idea, because it's coming. And so, you know, we take a look at young workers. Have you got young people in your family that work? So what you have to understand is, if you've got a young person that's at work right now, you know, these are the reasons people think young people get hurt at work. The real reason young people get hurt at work is, when you take a look at this article, it shows us that under the age of 25, the young brain cannot assess risk, because the brain is myelinated from the back to the front. And myelin is a fatty insulation that goes around neurons. And so by the time that's fully formed in the risk assessment area in the brain, that's at the age of 25, all right? And so that's why young people are great at getting injured. You know, I remember when my young boys were out uh, on the acreage doing stuff, and I'd come home and I'd say, what the hell were you guys thinking when you did that? And I'm talking dumb stuff. As long as they would say, I don't know, I knew they were telling the truth. Anything more than that was a bloody lie. Because these young men and women on Saturday night would watch these riveting documentaries. Jackass 1, Jackass 2. And so that's why I, I'm no longer surprised when I'm working in an emergency and some guy comes in and he had a Roman candle between his butt cheeks and he just blew his nuts off because he put it in the wrong way. And I go, that's Jackass 4, right? And he goes, yeah, I put it in the wrong way. Can, can you put my nuts back on? So the whole point is, we got a big job ahead of us, right? We got a big job ahead of us. Traffic injuries hopefully will disappear, and if they don't, then you have to understand that every traffic injury has three collisions that occur within a millionth of a second. 
The first collision is the vehicle with something. Second collision is the occupant if they're not restrained with the inside of the vehicle. And the third collision is the brain with the skull or the heart with the rib cage or the liver and the spleen with the rib cage, all right? So we, we've got to understand that every collision actually has three collisions and our goal is to minimize those. And Sweden's been able to do it and do it very successfully through looking at infrastructure, vehicle technology, and command centers and uh, vehicle design as well. So do we need to think differently? You know, this is, I mean, we've, I've got thousands of other slides, but I, I want to end right here. And the reason is I want to have a couple of questions with you and answers. But do we need to think differently? And I think the answer is absolutely. And I, and I think that this, whole thing in front of us is an opportunity that we can fix. And I think right now the, uh, the ball's in your court as you're meeting over the next two days. Hopefully this hasn't been too disruptive, but you gotta start thinking very differently because an opportunity is before you. And if you don't seize that opportunity, trust me, there's gonna be people that are gonna wanna do things probably radically differently and then you're gonna en enter into a confrontational stage as opposed to a leadership stage. So that's, that's pretty well all I have to say. I've got other slides. Um, some of the other slides are how you can become a better person yourself. So I'll leave the slides with the organizers and you can go through them at, uh, at your leisure. So hopefully that's helped. We started off by giving you the stats of Surrey. If those stats are parallel to what other... Oh, well, thank you very much. There's my little friend there. That's so, it's so, it's so nice to end on a positive note. Brought to you by sponsors, yeah. It's nice to have people looking out for your back, right? Yeah. All right, so the whole point is, that's uh, pretty well all we got time for. Hopefully it's challenged you to think a little differently, and at the end of the day, I hope it, um, it helps you on your journey to uh, reinventing yourself, because you, as others within society, have to reinvent ourselves. And in your case, you've been successful at doing one thing, now transfer that success to something different. And I would go after injuries first, and then I'd go after wellness, right? Do things that are doable. Go after the injury problem, and then once you're tackling that, start working on making sure that the people you serve are as healthy as you. So our goal is to make you healthy, and then make society healthy, and then free up resources so that they come right back to you to do more of what you do. Because if you can show them that you can do for injuries and wellness what you've done for uh, fire, why would you give the money to anyone else? Why would you give the money to anyone else if you're able to go and show them you've reduced injuries? You reduce injuries, you reduce costs within society. You make people healthier, you reduce costs within society. All right? Great opportunities. I, uh, I wish you all the absolute very best, and uh, I hope our paths cross again. And if uh, there's any questions, I'd love to uh, take any questions or comments that you may have. Is that okay? Take a yeah, couple? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, for sure. Come on, don't be shy. I usually pay 20 bucks for the first question. <laughs> okay, well, no, that's, that's a good sign. You either like me or you hate me, but who gives a shit either way, right? <laughs> no, no, because somebody told me. I, I talked to a firefighter before I came here, and he goes, make sure you swear and, like, don't suck up to them, you know. You've got to act like tough, right? Act like tough. So I hope I acted tough enough. Eh? <laughs> All right, see ya. Thank you, Doc.